What is hope? Where is hope? Maybe the best question is, when is hope? This year, time took a break. 365 days felt like an eternity. We've waited so long for something to happen. We'll put our trust in anything. But DoorDash doesn't deliver what we need the most. So we wait. We've been here before. From a garden, to a desert, to a promised land. From shepherds, to kings, to virgin mothers. Waiting is part of following a God who holds time in his hands. Is hope deferred? Still hope? Or does hope get canceled too? When we wait on God and he doesn't show up, hope feels like a never ending journey. Only the wisest of men follow a star for years. They say God is always on time, but I just wish he'd be early every once in a while. But just because he is silent doesn't mean he isn't inching closer. And if the hope of the universe can enter the world as eight pounds and cry, we can trust the hope can sustain us. That silent night echoes into our anxious days. We look ahead because of what has come before. The announcement of hope reverberates throughout all time. Angels still say, do not be afraid. Patience is a heavy thing, but hope tips the scale. Mercies are new every morning. His faithfulness is great. Because Jesus came, I have hope. Let's pray this morning. Father God, forgive us where we put our hope in things that cannot satisfy. Forgive us where we put our hope in things that don't fulfill us like only you can, Lord. Only you can fill our soul to its full capacity that we can spill out into a world that desperately needs you, O oh Lord. We can't see you, Lord, but we can hope in you. We know that you're with us, and Lord, as we enter this Christmas season, we pray that our hope, the hope that we can show as individuals and as a church, will in fact spill out into a world that can see you and maybe experience you for the first time, Lord. As we enter this Advent season, as we light the candle of hope, my prayer is that we will embody the reason Jesus came as a baby. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to worship this morning. It's wonderful to see all of you. Hope you had a wonderful time during Thanksgiving holidays with your family. And so we're looking forward to seeing what God has for us uh, through the service this morning. If you're visiting with us this morning for the first time, we'd like for you to take out your phone and text WELCOME to the number that will be on the screen. And there's also some Connect cards in the pew that is in front of you that you can fill out for us and drop in the offering plate on the way out. So I'd like to ask Dr. Hankins to come on up um, as we get ready to go into a time of baptism. Well, this is the first Sunday of Advent, and we set aside this time with our brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world to begin focusing our attention on the amazing gift that was given to us at Christmas time through Jesus Christ. It's important that we press into this idea of waiting and anticipation to take an opportunity to allow all the other distractions to be push, pushed to the margin so that our entire attention and affection can be directed towards the gift of Christ alone. So each week we'll be celebrating different aspects of what he's given to us during the Christmas season and we gather this morning in hope. And that hope looks forward to all that the gospel provides and we celebrate the gift of the gospel in uh, baptism in the picture of that baby that came, grew, lived perfectly, died, rose again for us. And when we gather as a church body, we gather because of the gospel. 
And when we pray and give and serve, it is for the announcement of this good news to the world. And so we celebrate our life in Christ. We celebrate all the good things that God is doing in our church. One of the signs of life, one of the indicators that God is is having his way in a body of believers is that the Lord uses such a body to, to, to be an environment for gospel call and ministry. And so I think you've rejoiced with me as God has set aside Shane Langley uh, to gospel ministry. And Shane has been in a process of, of, of obediently, Shane and his family, uh, of obediently saying yes to God in the area of ministry. Shane has uh, started uh, some ministry work with us here. Uh, he's in seminary uh, already, advancing in, in, a, in different uh, uh, courses in theology and different things. And God's been using him mightily in our church in so many ways as a deacon, as a Sunday school teacher. But Shane has also for years been leading a small group. In fact, he's been my son Jake's small group leader. And as a result of his consistent ministry and witness, uh, two young ladies who have been a part of that small group ministry have have said yes to Jesus. And it's Shane's opportunity as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ to baptize them Uh, this morning. And so we celebrate what God is doing. And as you pray and as you give, we're going to talk a bit about giving. As you give, people find out about Jesus. And so we're thankful and we celebrate along with these, uh, the families of these young ladies and our family of faith. So you give your attention to the baptistry as we celebrate the gospel. Good morning. It is an honor and a privilege to start the sermon or the morning off as worship with, with the ordinance of baptism. Uh, nothing should get us more excited as Christians than to, to see people come to Christ, to see the, uh, the, the true embodiment of the gospel come to life. And uh, baptism is just that. It's an outward expression of an inward change. You know, as, as believers, we know that uh, we're sinners. We have no way of communing with the holy God. Uh, and he had a plan for redemption. And that plan was his son, Jesus Christ. And we talk a little bit about hope. This morning we lit the candle of hope, and we know that our hope is in Christ and Christ alone. And uh, two girls that are in my 12th grade small group have made a decision to follow Christ, to, to uh, follow him in obedience through believer's baptism. And I get the honor and privilege of baptizing them. This is my, my very first baptism, so give me a little bit of leeway if I mess it up. But, uh, but what an example of our co-crucifixion with Christ. You know, we as believers are co-crucified. We, we are dead to ourselves, and then we're risen as new creatures you know when the old is gone the new is come and baptism is, an, is such an example of that and uh, this morning i'm excited for y'all to celebrate this with me nothing should take us to the throne of, of, of god to worship more so than baptism and a celebration of uh, a, a new believer a new a new uh, follower of christ so we're going to start out this morning um with with ally ally bailey is going to come down um ally's parents are krista and lance bailey uh, he is a member of my 12th grade small group. She's she's going to go to Auburn next year. Um, so be praying for her and that. You know, uh, not, not because of an issue with Auburn, but just because and, and for a serious moment, when kids go off to college, you, you always hope and pray that they're rooted in a strong foundation. And, and we hope and pray that Allie is. And this step forward is, is evidence of that. So um, Allie, uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, that he came down, uh, died on the cross for our sins and rose again? Yes. Uh, do you uh, commit to following him in a life uh, committed to Christ, to God's glory, and to the furtherance of his kingdom? Yes. Do you commit to being a part of this church and, and moving everything forward to make a difference in this world for Christ? Yes. Awesome. Well, because of your profession and faith and out of obedience to him, uh, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, buried with him in baptism through death and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. All right, and uh, Allie, Allie came uh, to small group because of Sinclair. Uh, she had gone through some moments in life that were kind of hard. She lost her grandmother, and 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 Allie, Allie's friend kind of drew her closer to Christ. And Sinclair has the same kind of story as she was drawn to Christ, and. Sinclair comes now with the same profession of faith. Her parents are Mary Francis and Dieter Krauss. Um, and uh, she's in my small group as well. She'll be going to Mississippi State next year. So continue to pray for her and her uh, step moving forward um, in independence, but also one firmed in Christ. Uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior who came down, died on the cross for our sins, and rose again? Yes. Uh, do you commit to following him in your life and, and glorifying God in all that you do and furthering his kingdom? Do you commit to joining this church and being a part of 
our membership and, and moving forward to glorify God in all we do. Yes. All right. Well, because of your profession and faith, oh, wait. you got it. <laughs> <laughs> because of your profession and faith and out of obedience to him, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Bear with him through baptism into death and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. know that we're not perfect but we're we've set our eyes on Jesus and we're following him and we're doing the best that we can as he empowers us to follow him such a wonderful testimony there Shane pouring his life into those girls in Bible study them receiving Christ and then coming in front of us as a church family and sharing with us their uh, new walk uh, with the Lord this past weekend, we've had uh, Thanksgiving. You've had a time to, to be thankful. Hopefully, we're thankful year-round. But we concentrated on being thankful. The song that we're going to sing offers thanksgiving to the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Would you sing along with us? Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the pride. Thank you for 
Sing worthy to him. You're still telling him, talk to him, sing to him this morning. And worthy of every song we could ever sing. And worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. to sing his name, Jesus. And Jesus, the name above every other name. And Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. He's worthy. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
We're trusting Him. And we praise Him. We're just asking Him to be the foundation of our life. His love. So sing, I will build my life.
never gonna let me down. You're telling him, you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. Let's pray together. Lord, in this time of thanksgiving, for all of your goodness to us that, that transitions us into this season in which we give thanks for the greatest gift ever given, God, it's, it's been good to sing of your goodness. You are good. You're so good. And you're not only good, you're great. You and you alone are worthy of our praise because of both your goodness and greatness. Cause us to be overwhelmed once again by your generosity to us. Let your great love for us through Christ change everything about us. I need that change in my life over and over and over again. We are to be grateful people. I pray that your spirit would make it so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Malachi, the very last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 6 through 15 of Malachi chapter 3. If you're like me, you like stories about coming home, right? Aren't those some of the best stories, the story of, of, of an individual who for different reasons finds themselves lost or far away from home and, and through trials and tribulations makes their way back home again. These stories are our best stories and they're some of our oldest stories. In fact, the very oldest story in Western civilization is the, is the Odyssey. It's written by Homer. It's a, a eight centuries before Christ. That old story, which was probably much older than eight centuries, was written down for the first time. It's a story of a man, very simply. It's got a lot of details to it, but at the end of the day, the Odyssey is just a man trying to get home. And those stories are told over and over and over again through many of our best stories. All those stories written by Tolkien about the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and all of those things really are coming home stories. C.S. Lewis's stories related to the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Those chronicles of Narnia really are about coming home. And they're our great stories. To Kill a Mockingbird, one of my favorite novels, is, a, is ultimately at the end of the day about a little boy and a little girl trying to get back home to their father. And all of those stories, as you well know, are simply echoes of the greatest homecoming story ever told. What's the greatest homecoming story ever told? This is the story of the Bible, the whole Bible. And somebody mentioned it right at the center, the story of the prodigal son sort of encapsulates in just a handful of verses the whole message of the whole Bible. Paradise lost in Genesis, regained in Revelation. The city of God, the dwelling of God, home again with God forever. That's the whole point of the Bible. And Jesus right at the crooks of that. What Christ has done for us is he's opened the door. In fact, he says, I am the door. And he makes us a way for us to come and that parable that Jesus tells. Isn't that the story of us all? Recipients of so many good and wonderful things, yet we, we take these things and we spend them on ourselves. And the scripture says, Jesus says in Luke's gospel, we squander them, selfish living, and soon it's all gone. And we're in a far country where we've messed everything up. And then a little whisper comes to us, we come to ourselves. We turn and hope, make our way home to find a father who's been waiting for us all along. Don't you love stories about coming home? Well, that's what Malachi is talking about in Malachi chapter 3. In fact, he is speaking for the Lord, and the Lord says, return to me. Come home to me. I want you to come home. Where the people of God find themselves in the book of Malachi, it's the very chronologically last book written. The people, on one level, they have returned. They've come back from exile. They've, they, they've rebuilt the temple and they rebuilt the sacrificial system. They rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem. They, they sort of have externally a lot of home has been rebuilt and yet they still feel themselves to be in exile. They're not quite home yet. They find themselves still standing outside kind of like that older brother in the story. Not fully home, still under foreign domination, still struggling with obedience, still not experiencing, never even really seeing the Shekinah glory, the very manifest presence of God come and dwell in that temple that they had, been, they had rebuilt, and they're not home yet. And as Malachi turns to the conclusion of his prophecy, through Malachi, the Lord says, come home to me return to me. But what I want you to see this morning is it's a, it's a bit of a surprising, even strange homecoming. It's a strange homecoming. It's an unexpected little twist that characterizes the way home in Malachi. Would you stand with me as we honor God in the reading of his word? Beginning in verse 6 of chapter 3 of Malachi, 
Here's what the Lord says through his prophet. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. I, the Lord, never change. That's why you haven't been consumed. Verse 7, from the days of your fathers, you've turned aside. You've turned. You've gone away from me. You've turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I'll return to you. Hear that. Just let that, let that fall like like spring rain on your soul, return to me and I'll return to you. I want you to come home. But you say, how do we return? Isn't that a good question this morning? How do we come back? How do we come home? And God says this, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. You say, have we robbed you? And the Lord says, in your tithes and offerings. And you're cursed with a curse. For you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that that there may be food in my house and test me now in this. The only time the Lord says anything like this in his scriptures. Test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it won't destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts, and all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. You can be seated. That's right, boys and girls, it's a tithing sermon. But I've been blown away afresh by this text. And one of the things that I want you to hold in your hands is all that's being offered to you. Some of you, when you hear a sermon on tithing or giving, you think, oh, here we go again. Back in church, and they're, they're wanting to take something from me. I am not wanting to take anything from you. And I preach and proclaim the gospel for a God who does not need anything. Let's settle something real quickly this morning. Does God need anything from you? No. No, if he needed anything from you, he wouldn't be God. So he does not need anything. What's one of the main reasons why God doesn't need anything from you? Because he owns everything. He already owns it. It's already his. And so one of the things I want to dispel is that, is that I don't want to take anything from you. The only thing that I'm trying to do through God's word and that God is trying to say to you is I'm trying to give you something. Would you like to have what God wants for you? Maybe we ought to get that squared away as well. Would you like to have what God wants for you? I think we ought to give that a try. In fact, I'm kind of tired. You're probably kind of tired of having what you want for you. We've also tried that out. It's no good. It doesn't work. We're always wrong about it. It ends up being the wrong thing. So let's just dispense with that. And so all God's trying to do is say to his people and on the other side of the cross to us today, I'm trying to give you something. I am trying to give you something. Something, in fact, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to open the windows of heaven. I'm trying to pour out blessings on you. I'm trying to restore you to everything I originally have for you. Don't you hear the echoes of heaven all the way through this? You'll be a delightful land. Wouldn't you like to be delightful? I'm not sure that anyone's ever said, that that Eric Hankins, he sure is delightful. (laughs) Right? Maybe not the first word that jumps to your mind when you think of me, but I want to get there. I want to be delightful. I want us as a church to be a delightful people. And so as we draw our year to a conclusion and we look forward to the upcoming year, as we think about Thanksgiving, as we think about the gift of Christ in Christmas, I do want to challenge you in the area of your tithes and offerings. It's a gift that God has given to you and a way for you to come home. And so he says to his people, I want you to come home. And if you're looking for a good way to come home, you tithe. If you're looking for a good way to come home, an essential element of that is to give, is your tithe and your offering. And if you'll, in obedience, say yes to that, the point of your giving is so that God can respond in covenant relationship with you to give you all of who he is and to to actually include you in what he's up to in bringing restoration to you and all the earth through us, his people. And so I'm not ashamed or embarrassed to call you and challenge you in the area of tithing. In fact, next Sunday, uh, you, if you're a church member, you received a letter in the mail challenging you about your giving, to pray about how God would, would not only 
call you to tithe, but also to, to stir you to an offering above that tithe as we think about, as we think about our giving for next year. If we're going to meet budget for next year and do all the things that God is calling us to do as a church, then all of us are going to have to be praying about and preparing for and planning to be obedient in the area of tithes and offerings. And it's going to be so awesome to see what God does. And so next Sunday we'll gather and you're going to bring a little commitment card with you. I hope that you got it. We can provide you with one. For a long time in Baptist life anyway, we called it prove the tithe. Prove the tithe. Uh, what, what the Lord says in this passage of Scripture is test me in this and, and, and see if I won't pour out for you a blessing. You can test me in this. I want to prove to you what kind of God I am towards you. And so we're going to prove the tithe next Sunday, And so you come, and, and maybe one of the things you need to do is, is you haven't been tithing, is you can bring a tithe next Sunday. Step back into obedience and, and faith. Maybe you just need to catch your tithe up next Sunday. It's been a busy time and an odd time, and things have sort of been all over the place financially, and maybe you haven't been paying attention to a few things, and you can catch that tithe up next Sunday. But we're going to see what happens. And it's a little bit of what would things look like at our church if everyone was obedient in the area of tithes and offerings? What would it look like? I'd kind of like to see it. I'd kind of like to see what, what that would look like for us together. As a people in every area of their lives, put them in position for God to work mightily in us. And so how do we come home through the tithe? That's what this message is, is about. And I want you to see five things very quickly. I'm going to go ahead and tell you all five things so you can start getting excited now about what obedience in this area looks like for you. The first thing you're going to see is home. You can come home. And isn't it nice when, when everything is right at home? When things are right at home, it doesn't matter what's going on outside. You're going to be okay. And so home, how to come home. Home is where the covenant is kept. That's why the Lord is teaching his people through the tithe, through the offering, through their giving. To teach them, first of all, home is where the covenant is kept. Secondly, home is where the devourer is rebuked. Thirdly, home is where the storehouse is full. Fourth, home is where the windows are open. And fifth, home is where strangers are blessed. Wouldn't you like to see all five of those things? Let's watch how this text lays this out for us very quickly. First of all, and my wonderful communications director, Sharon Pippen, has helped me with a little object lesson. And so we're going to build a house this morning. And the first part of that house, the foundation, and the most important part that I want you to see, first of all, is that home is where covenant is kept. If we're going to build a home, it's going to be on the foundation of the Lord. God says, beginning in verse 6, for I, the Lord, I don't change. That's why you haven't been consumed. Even though, Jacob, even though Israel, you've done everything wrong, you've disobeyed my directions. That's what that word statutes means. From the days of your father, you've turned aside from my statutes. This is the map. These are the directions, and you haven't followed my directions, and that's why you're still lost. You haven't followed my directions, and that's why you're not home but I don't change. I'm always keeping my end of the covenant. And in the new covenant on the other side of the cross, all God's promises have been kept in Christ Jesus. He's done everything. And now he just offers us the opportunity to obey him in faith. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what I say. And so the people say, well, how have we blown it? How have we messed up? And God says, it's easy. You're robbing me. I've asked you for 10% and I let you keep 90%. And those first fruits are to be brought to me. And then whatever else I ask for in addition to that, and you need to be asking me once a week or so, what is it that, God, that you want me to give? But when you don't obey me and that you're robbing me, that means to take by force and hide it. It's a picture and an echo of Achan. Remember the story of Achan in the book of Joshua? He takes what doesn't belong to him and he puts the whole nation at risk as a result. So God says, I want to be in a covenant relationship with you. You know what makes a good home? One of the factors that makes a really good home is where it's filled with people who don't have a me first attitude. Home is really good when it's not filled with people who are just looking out for their own interest and doing what is best for them. In fact, if you have a place that's filled with people who are only looking out for themselves, it isn't a home. It's really more like a penitentiary or an insane asylum, but it's not home. And so God calls us into covenant relationship with himself. I'll be your God, and you'll be my people. I've done everything necessary to save you, and I'm calling you to be in fellowship with me. 
And so he's made it real clear. Do you know what a tithe is? It's 10% of what you make. And so you just add up everything you make in a year, and then you move it over one decimal place, uh, and that shows you what uh, you're to give the Lord in a year. God's made it real clear. It's a tenth. It's a tenth, and that's to be given to the Lord, and that's to be given in his storehouse. That's to be given to the church. That's just a good principle. And while this is an Old Testament principle, it's affirmed in the New. Jesus speaks of the, of the tithe positively in Matthew 23, and he says there's even more to do. You don't just tithe and do nothing else, but you tithe and you pay attention to the weightier matters of the law like justice and mercy. But Jesus affirms the tithe, and it's a part of a biblical principle that we're called as God's people to be generous givers. And so home is where covenant is kept. Are you going to do what the Lord has asked you to do in this area? There's a pastor named Francis Chan I really like. He told his congregation, he gave him this illustration one time. He says, imagine if I go up to my teenage daughter's room and, and uh, uh, Pastor Chan said that his teenage daughter's room looks like most teenage girls' rooms. I used to have a teenage girl in, in my house. She's grown and gone now. But I can tell you, girls can be very messy. He noticed that before. And if he goes up to his, imagine if he went up to his daughter's room and said, I want you to clean up the room, your room, and comes back a couple of hours later, and the room is still as messy as it was before. And he asks his congregation, what if my daughter says, well, I hear that command about cleaning the room. It's a great, it's a good command. My friends and I have gotten together, and we formed a study of how to clean a room. Uh, and we're, uh, we're really going through a variety of cleaning products and cleaning techniques. We're, we're thinking about what kind of a, 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 a vacuum cleaner to use. And should we start high and work down low or start low and work up high? Should we get organized first? Maybe we need some bins with some, with some, with some cute notes on the front. What's dad going to say? Just clean your room. Just clean the room. It's time to do it. Quit talking about it and examining it and analyzing it to death. I've asked you to do something as your father that's a blessing to you and everyone else in the house. And it's what it means to be in right relationship with one another, that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And so the foundation, foundation, the cornerstone about giving is that we're in a covenant relationship with a holy God who's inviting us to participate with him. And so God's commanded us concerning a tithe. Secondly, home is where the devourer is rebuked. Sharon has numbered these for me, and I'm going to see if I can correctly put them together. All right? Does that look correct? All right, there's a front door. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. He can be taught. Yes. Uh, secondly, home is where the devourer is rebuked. Uh, God says, um, verse uh, verse. Eight, will a man rob God, yet you've been robbing me, but you say to me, how have we robbed you? And God says, in tithes and offerings, and so you're cursed with a curse because you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Verse 11, God speaks about his desire to rebuke the devourer for you so that you won't find yourself running against the grain of the provision and care and blessing of the Lord. There's an echo in here in the book of Haggai. Haggai was a prophet who was prophesying just about the generation before Malachi. The people had returned, but instead of building the Lord's house, they built their own house. And Haggai says to them, do you want to know why you keep putting money into your pockets? But when you reach into your pockets, there's nothing there. It's because you have not been obedient to the Lord and there are holes in your pockets. You ever had that experience? You ever had that experience? doing what you want to do, what work in your plan, but it just never seems to work out. And then have you found the opposite to be true? I have found this over and over and over again. When I'm obedient to the tithe, even in my early going, when I didn't have very much, when I was faithful and obedient to what God had asked me to give, he was always providing for me. The needs were always met. In a book by Richard Foster called The Celebration of Discipline. He speaks some about the discipline of giving. And he says, one of the things that giving does is it breaks the stronghold of Satan. What does Jesus say Satan wants to do? John chapter 10. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. And he wants to destroy. He doesn't want you to be a delight. 
He doesn't want you to have the experience of God's provision over your life in every area. He wants to absolutely destroy that. And one of the things that giving does, because see, Satan's a taker. That's all he does. And Satan believes that taking is the most important thing to do. And taking is how you have what you want. And taking is what really makes you happy. And he's going to take, and he wants everybody else just to take too. And so when you give... It's, a, it's an expression of faith and a statement to the enemy that says, the world does not supply me with what I need. I don't have to have any of this stuff. And there's a supernatural stronghold-breaking power in the biblical obedience of giving. And God says, I'll rebuke the devourer for you. I'll break a stronghold of spiritual sickness in your life where you're constantly dissatisfied and you're constantly uh, uh, experiencing uh, that, that cursed existence going all the way back to the garden where God says over Adam, you're going to work the ground and you're going to work the ground and you're going to work the ground and it never does produce enough. That's what sin and disobedience does. And God says, I don't want you to live like that. I want to rebuke the devourer. I want the home to be a place where there's always enough. I want the home to be a place where there's a supernatural reality of generosity and provision that the world can't destroy. You can go to the Harlem neighborhood just outside of Amsterdam and still standing there today is number 19, Bartoliostret. Number 19, Bartoliostret. And number 19, Bartoliostret was built in 1600. That little house that's built above a little shop has been standing since 1600. And at the end of the 1800s, a man named Casper Ten Boom inherited that home, continued as, as a watchmaker in that home, and raised his family there. And when all the forces of evil of Nazi Germany came pouring into the Netherlands and pouring into that city and pouring into that neighborhood, the Ten Booms at number 19 Bartolio Street, continued to have a spirit of generosity. And they opened up their home. And that home was a place where needs could always be met. And that home was always a place where there was going to be love and welcome no matter what the threat. And 800 people lived instead of died underneath the Nazi onslaught because the 10 booms at number 19 Bartolio Street kept opening up their home, and God kept providing. Nazi Germany's gone, but that little house of grace still stands, and it's a testimony that has literally changed the world. The devourer was rebuked. Even as he devoured everything around it, the devourer was rebuked in that home because of a spirit of generosity. We build our homes as a place of safety, we build the home and the kingdom of God as a place where we can run a strong tower and a refuge. And we live in a supernatural reality that being, brings the protection of God and the release of supernatural power, which leads thirdly, home is where the storehouse is full. Chapter, or, or chapter 3, verse 10, the last half of verse 10 Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. I'll just read the whole verse. So that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord, if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing for you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. The very specific reason that God is giving for people being obedient to the tithe is so that, so that the people of God will have what they need. This is also an echo of, of a reality during Nehemiah's day. At the very end of the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah comes and notices that the people have rebuilt the wall, they rebuilt the temple, but they're not tithing. And, be, and, and because they're not tithing, the Levites don't have what they need to be able to keep the sacrificial system going. And so the Levites are leaving and they're going back to, to homes and farms elsewhere because there's not enough resources in the house of God. That's why you give. You give so that the house is full. That, that's number three. I've got to follow my directions here. All right. I think I'll go here. Let me look up. Am I doing good, Sharon? She's giving me the thumbs up. All right. Okay. 
We only went over this 62 times, still got it locked in. And this is the, this is the simplest part of, of the message. And what God is telling his people is, is he says, I've given you the privilege of joining me in what I'm doing in all the earth. And when you give, needs are met. A good home, there's always something to eat. Even through difficult times and, and hardship, even when you've got, get, got to get creative, in a good home, there's always enough for everyone. And so we give so that the storehouse is full. And the practical principle here is it's not equal giving, it's equal sacrifice. When everybody gives their tenth, the promise is that we'll have everything we need to do to accomplish everything God wants to accomplish, accomplish in us and through us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, here's the principle. Paul says, now I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows abundantly will reap bountifully. For each one must do just as he proposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you might have an abundance for every good deed. There ought to be a perfect match between everything that God is calling our church to do and the provision that he gives through his people. That's what it looks like. Instead of worrying about budget being better, are we going to have enough, or oh my goodness, is that we'll have all the resources we need to do everything God has called us to do as a church. Let me ask you, church, would you like to be able to do everything God calls us to do? Yeah. Would you like to be able to do everything God calls us to do? Yes. yes, amen. Not everything I want us to do, not everything Pastor Brent wants us to do, but we want to do everything that God has called us to do. And the promise is that if we'll be obedient, everything we need is going to be provided for us to do everything God has called us to do. That's a great promise and a great hope. Home is where the storehouse is full. Fourthly, home is where the windows are open. It just keeps getting better. Not only is the storehouse full, if that were, weren't enough, God goes on to say, test me in this and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. <laughs> Do you believe that? See, sometimes in the Baptist church, we read that and we get scared of the name it, claim it kind of uh, uh, prosperity gospel. You know, I give $10, God has a guarantee, give me a Mercedes, something like that. But what we end up doing is we run away from the clear promise of Scripture. What does it say here? See if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Now, do you believe that? Well, that's an Old Testament verse. Well, let's look in the New Testament then. And let's look into the words of Jesus. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Jesus says, give and it will be given to you good measure, shaken, down, shaken, pressed, running over, flowing into your lap. Give and it will be given to you. Now, what that blessing looks like, that's God's business. But do you want an overflowing blessing in your life? Do you want an overflowing blessing in your life? I, I, I'd like that from the Lord. Not only does the Lord want our church to have everything it needs to do, everything the church has been called to do, but the Lord wants you to have everything you need to do everything he's made you for. I'd love to see that. And so the question is, and, and Jesus goes on to say, so with the measure that you give, that's how it will be measured back to you. Man, think about that for a little bit. With the measure that you give, that's how it's going to be measured back to you. And I think, I don't think, God is calling us into that kind of spiritual economy. And we're going to have some opportunities in the coming days and weeks to hear from some of you tell your testimony. But I'm telling you, this room is full of people who can give testimony to God's faithfulness in the tithe to provide just at the right time. I know I've got my stories. Jen and I gave our last pennies to give our tithe one week. Went down to our little church where we were serving in college. An old gruff deacon walked up to me and shoved an envelope in my hand and said, here! And I opened it up and it was exactly what we had tithed. Now I got more stories than that and so do you. But God proves himself over and over and over again. Test me in this. 
Home is where the windows are open. A couple of years ago, I got to hear David Green, the CEO of Hobby Lobby, uh, give his testimony at, at the University of Mobile's big fundraising dinner. Hobby Lobby is a $3 billion a year business, $3 billion a year. But from day one, David Green has said, the whole thing belongs to the Lord. And the, and the tithe is really where you start, but, but this is God's business. And I'm going to be just as generous as I possibly can be as God directs my mind and my heart to give. Do you know how much David Green has given to evangelical kingdom work? A half a billion dollars. And he can't wait to give more. His hopes really are effectively to give it all away. And his whole attitude is, as I keep widening my bucket so that it could be poured out for the glory of Christ. God just keeps filling it. And I can't wait to see what he's going to do next. And so the question is, how much glory do you want God to receive? All of it. Thank you, brother. All of it. That's the question. How much glory do you want God to receive? And when, when the answer becomes all of it, then we get to experience what it looks like in our lives. Maybe it's not $500 million dollars may not be $500 million for you or me, but it'll be all that we were created and redeemed for, all of it. That needs to be the answer. And then finally, home. Oh, I didn't do right. I forgot box four. Doggone it. I got close, Sharon, but just couldn't, couldn't quite close the deal. All right, sorry. This was the best part. These are the windows of heaven opening up, right? Okay, or the windows of heaven are flowing into this window, something like that, right? God's going to open up those windows, and then finally, oh, there it is. The blessing to the nations crowns it all. Isn't that nice? Yes, amen. <laughs> Verse 12, all the nations will call you blessed. For you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, you have the theme of the whole Bible where God says to Abraham, if you'll obey me, go where I tell you to go, even though you don't know where that is. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you great. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to give you lots and lots of descendants. And all the families in the earth will find a blessing in you. That's the whole story. That's how things wrap up in the book of Revelation. Every, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation gathering around Jesus, lifting up praise and glory and honor to him. And when we're faithful, the Lord says what he's going to do is he's going to bless the nations. Something else you're going to be hearing about, not only improve the tithe Sunday next week, but in our giving for missions for Lottie Moon, is that we have this thrilling privilege of joining God and bringing the gospel to the world. Right now, our 1,900, we got all the way to 1,900 boxes. Right now, 1,900 boxes that you gave are making their way to somewhere in the world China, amen, amen. China and Africa and, 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 and Middle East, Ukraine. And we're, we're going to enjoy heaven finding out what happened to those boxes. Isn't it a thrill to be invited to be a delight to the nations? to be the kind of people through whom all the nations can be blessed. Only God could figure out how to make that so through his son Jesus. And only God would be good enough to let us join him in that work. That's what it means to come home, to dwell with a good God calls us to be a part of his family and invites and welcomes the stranger, invites the whole world home. That's what being transformed by the gospel looks like. And the question is, have you been transformed this way? Would you bow your heads with me? Here's a question. When you hear about the call to give, to call to tithe? Does your heart just start throwing up objections? Maybe it even makes you cynical. Maybe it makes you set your jaw. 
I want to give you a little challenge, maybe even, maybe even a little warning. If that's your spiritual response to the call to give, it's a, it's a strong indicator that you've never been changed by Jesus. Because those who've been transformed by the gospel understand what it means to be dealt with generously. That they're, they're changed by the generosity of God. And so the place you may need to begin this morning, even if you don't like the message I just preached, is we're going to stand and we're going to sing and you can come and you can just make this confession. God, I struggle to give because I've never received salvation that comes from you. I'm still trying to do it all on my own and my own wisdom. Mostly my life is a life that's been chewed up. I know what the devourer is about. And I need for that to be totally changed. And we'll stand in a moment and you can come. I can walk with you. into the home for your heart that can be found in Christ alone. Others of you, for, for different reasons, you're not connected to a church body, and so you don't have a place where you can come and pray and, and serve and give. And so you're missing out on a blessing. Maybe today's the day. We've put our cards on the table for you. We try to do that every week. Maybe the Lord has prompted your heart. This is a place where I can pour my life. This is a place where I can come home. And finally, there are those of you in this Thanksgiving and Christmas season, maybe you just need to come to this altar and say, God, thank you. God, give me a vision for my life of generosity in the days to come. Open the windows of heaven and pour out for me the blessing with which I can bless the world. Oh God, I pray that we would respond this morning with obedience that we as your people may come fully in, fully home, fully in the joyous, protective, provisional, prospering, world-changing life that you've planned for us with one another and with you. Lord, help us to realize this morning, you're not trying to take anything from us. You're trying to give us the best. Because that's all you've ever been trying to do with us. Drive these things down home in our spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? This hymn of invitation is for you. Pastor John is going to lead it. And as we sing, if you feel like it's time to say yes to Jesus, you come as we sing. John? Oh.
bow your heads with me as our invitation and time of corporate worship draws to a conclusion. Just in the quietness of your heart. We don't often do what I'm fixing to say, but we, we should. Which is, would you be willing right where you stand to go ahead and begin the process of preparation for next week's worship? As a people, we're going to prove the tithe. We're going to test the Lord. Watch what he does. And if this is an area of a special struggle for you, I'm praying for you. I get it. I understand. It's hard to let go. Would you just go to the Lord and, and say, God, I trust your word. I agree with you concerning your word, and I need you to help me. None of us follow God's word without an amazing transformation of grace and wisdom that comes from him. But God, would you get me, would you speak to me? Would you speak to my spouse? Would you speak to my family? Maybe you need to have a whole family conversation about what it's going to mean to get obedient in this area in your life. But would you just say, God, get me ready that I can hear from you and that I can step into obedience. Father, I thank you for what you've done already and what you're going to do in the days to come. Thank you for my church family. Lord, help us to build a household of faith. Lord, help us to let you build our household of faith according to your wisdom. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated? I have a few things to share with you. Sean? Hasn't it been good to be together this morning? Amen. Just to repeat a little bit what Dr. Hankins said about Operation Christmas Child, the 1900 boxes, and Miss Carolyn said, make sure they know I did not make that number up, that it actually did land on an even 1900 boxes. So we wanted to clarify that. She didn't, she didn't round it up or anything. It was truly 1900 boxes. A couple of things before we head to Bible study. Uh, an opportunity for the kids this week on December the 4th. We'll have breakfast with Santa here at the church for the preschool and children from 9 to 11. And then also on December the 4th, the Love Like Jesus silent auction and barbecue will be at Streets Exquisite Plants. Um, and that will be from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Um, they'll have a rifle, and they're still looking for items to auction off. But all those pre proceeds that they make every year go to the Women's Care Medical Center, which is something that is dear to, to my heart and to the, to the heart of the church. Uh, also, this Wednesday night will be the budget presentation for 2022, and that will be at 545 in the Fellowship Hall. But also let me invite you, if you don't have a Bible study that you're a part of that, that immediately follows this service at 1030, you can stop by the Welcome Center and be somebody that will help you find one. And also, if you came this morning to give, the offering plates are at the back on your way out. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hankins to uh, bring our new members before the church. Absolutely. Before I do that, let me also remind you, next Sunday we'll be celebrating uh, the life and ministry of Bubba and Debbie Sawyer, and uh, they're uh, 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 making that transition to retirement, and so we're going to have a great time of celebration uh, next week and want you to be uh, praying and thinking about that. We're going to be honoring them, uh, and it's our honor uh, to, to uh, honor them for the tremendous blessing they've been in our lives. That'll be next week, and we'll be letting you, uh, and reminding you, letting you know more and reminding you about that in the days to come. Now let me invite the Gillespies to come stand with me here, Judd and Michelle Gillespie. Uh, they are coming fo forward uh, this morning as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to join our church. And I told them, if you'll join on a tithing Sunday, you just took it to the next level. You know, that's awesome. And so, amen, amen. And indeed, they love the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, he's, he's at the center of their lives and their, and their life together, uh, and they have uh, been uh, seeking his will concerning a connection here uh, at, uh, at uh, First Baptist Church. This is coming home for uh, Michelle, that's right, uh, as well. Many of you know and, and love her and her family, uh, and uh, uh, we are so thankful that God's brought Judd and Michelle here, and I can't wait to see uh, what God's going to do uh, in our lives. Uh, they have an incredible testimony of God's goodness and um, 
And I think God's got a, a lot of awesome things in store. We can't wait to see what God's going to do in our lives through you. Can't wait to see what God's going to do in your lives. If you've been obedient today, uh, there are new things that our Savior wants to teach uh, you and us together as we follow him. Well, um, church, if you sense the Holy Spirit uh, drawing this couple to be a part of our life together, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Well, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, uh, after we're finished and before you head to your Bible study time, if you want to come up and greet uh, the Gillespie's before you go, we'd love for you to do that and uh, look forward to seeing you again on Wednesday night. Uh, be sure to be in prayerful preparation for that. Uh, if you would, please stand. Is that right? And Sean Trotter is going to dismiss us in prayer. All right, let's pray. God, we're just thankful for this opportunity to be together. We're thankful for the time of, of worship and the preaching of your word, God, and we're so grateful just to be together as one church family this morning. And we thank you for bringing us the Gillespie's and thank you for them coming to be a part of our church family, Father, and help us to, to lead them and to shepherd them in the way that you have called us. So go with us the rest of the day, Father. Help us to, as we go into our Bible studies, as we learn more about you. Father, help us to be salt and light this week as we go our ways. In Christ's name I pray, amen.